message about abrasive sandpaper people light up the room more when they leave it than when they get in it if you know anybody like that there was kind of three different messages the first one was about complaining sandpaper people complain they complain about complaining right they complain sandpaper people spend all their time complaining about stuff and don't spend any time with resolutions sandpaper people are complainers gossips was the next gossips talk about somebody with the demeaning of their character we are definitely a people called to lift each other up and not do that we when we speak about someone it is for their good not to their detriment with hopes that they will be restored with with even a helping hand to help restore them the conversation that should go like joe is having a problem i love joe so i'm gonna go help joe goes like did you hear about joe and what he did that's that's gossip and remember we put gossip in the same category as murderers as idolaters paul called them out for having no fidelity no love and no mercy gossips are sandpaper people too and then we talked about having our focus off of the real battle at hand we talked about fighting like watching watching the news and and just so you can hear what you're supposed to be mad about today you got should I listen to CNN today or should I listen to Fox News today? What, what, what am I going to be mad about today? Remember, we're not, we're not called to fight every battle we're invited to. Now, some people like to fight every battle, but we're not really called to fight every battle we're invited to. Remember about David. Remember what David did. David's brother tried to get him distracted. David's brother, Eliab, the oldest brother. Of course, it's the oldest brother. He tried to get David distracted and, and tried to get, pick a fight with him, even though he wouldn't fight the giant that had been in front of him for 40 days. When the real problem out, was out in the field before them, the giant was trying to kill everybody and wanted to kill them. But David, being the spiritual one in that situation, he just didn't even pay any attention to his brother. And he kept on towards the mission. Sandpaper people don't do that. Sandpaper people get distracted. They fight the wrong battles. They're angry all the time. And they fight amongst themselves because they're on the, wrong, on the wrong path. You are going the wrong way. When that little red sign goes up and you're, you see something strange about you pulling on the highway and the little red sign says, wrong way, you are going the wrong way. Read the signs. If you read the signs, you will figure out very quickly, everybody else is going this way and I'm going that way. You are definitely going the wrong way. Well, here's what I know so far from, from, from what we've been, everything that we've talked about so far, complaining, gossiping, fighting the wrong battles, all those things keep our focus off the mission at hand. Amen. If I was the enemy and wanted to distract everybody, that's exactly what I'd do. I'd make sure we had plenty of stuff to gossip about, plenty of stuff to fight about, plenty of stuff to complain about, and then the, the force that has been put in this world to do the most good, to tell people the good news, would be fighting amongst themselves and too busy to go do the mission at, at hand, which is to tell people about Jesus. That's how, exactly how the enemy works. We'd be too busy fighting silly battles to stand together in the real one, like David did. Too busy talking about each other to actually talk to each other, to communicate so that we can work together. And too busy complaining about everything to get anything done at all. And I don't know about you, but to me that is powerless. That is fruitless living. And I don't want to be like that. And we as a church, we're definitely not supposed to be like that. We're being called to so much more. We're, we're supposed to be a people of love and light gracious and merciful and when and when we walk into the world we're not supposed to be abrasive and rub up against and 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 bruise everybody we come in contact with not supposed to be like that Amen. if we can if we can't learn to love if we can't learn to work together and carry each other's burdens to help each other so that we can go help out into the world the gospel is never going to go farther than this room right here and if it does, it's certainly not going to be attractive to anybody because you see right through it. There won't be any love in the middle of it. We are called to do both. 
So let's go to Scripture this morning, and uh, let's, let's, let's see what we find in Scripture. Scripture is going to be Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and then we'll have another one from Luke in a little bit. So we're going to do some work in the Word this morning if you want to pull your Bible out. We actually have a really cool Grace app if you want to pull up that app, hit it, and then you can go, the Bible is actually in there. You can pull it out on your smartphone. You can pull out your paper Bible and actually use that too if you want to. But however you're going to uh, see the word, it'll also be on the screen. Let's stand in honor of the reading of the word this morning. We'll be standing for a very short period of time. Here it is, Galatians 1 and 2, chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> so really, in the whole series of Sandpaper People, we've been talking about sin. We've just been talking about it in a number of different ways. In essence, whether you're inside of the church or outside of the church, sin is still the same divisive, destructive, separative, separating from God, life-taking thing it's always been. And, of course, the antithesis of that is if sin is the problem, then Jesus is the solution. And uh, that's a good place for an amen. But in order to do that, it means that we're going to have to bear with each other to help each other uh, to walk this road. And, and the church is supposed to be a place of helping each other. Here's the problem with that. <laughs> it's going to be really good sometimes. There's going to be super high mountaintop experiences. There's going to be victories in life. Look how many babies have been born in the church, and there's been awesome things that have happened in the church in the, last time, in, the, in the last year and a half, right? It's been great things, but on the other side of that, there's also been losses. There is terrible, shocking, and heartbreaking things that have happened. Willful sin, it, it, it happens, and, and we know whenever that happens, there's consequences. Sometimes the consequences, they never go away. There's grace and mercy and forgiveness and, and restoration, but there's always consequences that you kind of have to deal with when on, on, your other, on the other side of it. And when you see the effects of that sin playing out in somebody's life, you really are brought to a place where you need to choose. Choose what you're going to do. When you see it, it causes you to cringe because if you've been there, you kind of know what's coming, right? There's some, it's going to be awful. You see them going that way. They won't listen. You, you can't help, and, and it happens, and you know the consequences are coming. It, it, it almost turns your stomach when you see it's going to happen. But at the point of your stomach turning, you kind of have a choice. What, what am I going to do now? I can either, I can ignore them, like that ain't my problem. We, we, we heard about that. I can, I, can, I can gossip and talk about them. Uh, I, I can complain about it. I, I can do anything but what I'm supposed to do. But when I should be doing is when, when these sins are, are coming up, when we see somebody struggling, we are a people that are called to run to them and not run away from them. Don't let sin stop you from running to someone. This place, this church, uh, it's not supposed to be the cleanest place in the world. Did you know that? It's okay if there's a mess in here. I'm not, I'm not just talking about in, in here when we have dinners and we spill food on the floor. I'm talking about we're all in this together. I'm talking about we're all in different places in our walk. And if there's a mess and if we're having problems with something, this should be the kind of place where you come and, can, and feel comfortable telling somebody so that, so that you can get help. It should be a place of restoration, a place uh, where you come uh, to get things fixed. That's, that's what the church is supposed to be. And in the last 20 years, I, I've been in the church about 20 years now. I didn't grow up in church. I'm, I, I don't know how God found me, except I know that he did, and he put me on this whole other path. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. But, all that beside, but I've learned in the last 20 years that the church can be a very harsh place sometimes. As a matter of fact, a church can be a place where we kind of do the opposite of what we're called to do, where we're called to, to help the people that are wounded 
and we've become famous in some, in some circles for shooting our wounded. And that's, that's, that's not good. We, we, we're here to help. We're here to, to help people through things. And this scripture is kind of telling us uh, a little bit about that. We should be running to the people who are in trouble, not running away from them. We shouldn't be hesitating. We should just go and try to help out. I know it's dirty. I know it's messy. I know it's a problem. I know it's uncomfortable. So what? Go anyways. You've been called to do it. So let's, let's be the kind of people uh, that do that. Sandpaper people, when somebody's in trouble, when your brother or sister is in trouble, they go, they go the other way. They talk about them. They do anything but do what they're supposed to do, and that is go and help them. So in the scripture today, the first thing in verse 1 it talks about is brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters, and we ought to act like it. Now, I know if you're an older brother in here or older sister, you think you have some given right to pound on your, other, on your younger siblings. I know you probably think that. This is not true. Not true in families and not really too in, true in church. All right, we don't, we don't pound on our brothers and sisters. You know why? That's no way to treat our brother and sister. Think about brother or sister for just a second. If you are somebody's brother and sister, that means you have the same parents. That means you're in the same family, right? You guys are blood, kin, and, and in the church, it's the same way. We might, we, not, we might not be brothers and sisters by blood, but we're certainly brothers and sisters by the Spirit. We have the same Lord. We're all united under the banner of Christ. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. We are all together in this. And we don't kick each other when they're down. And we certainly don't run the other way when somebody's in trouble. And we don't go, ew, when it's messy. We just go and we help because that's what we're called to do. We, we, we act like brothers and sisters, whether it's a big problem and it's difficult or whether it's easy, we're called to be good brothers and sisters. So we help. We dress wounds. We take part in restoration. We run to the problem instead of running away from it. And when we do that, healing starts to happen. That, that big mess, it starts to get cleaned up on the inside and even on the outside. The, the mercy and grace starts to flow into the situation because we aren't meant to go this, through this by ourselves. And I'm going to illustrate that a little bit later. So once you run to the problem, once you run to try to help, the first thing you do is, is something like out of military first aid. It's called triage. You, you know, first triage, triage, you go and you kind of assess the situation. And you take, take wounded and you put them in categories. Okay, well, this guy's walking wounded. He's okay. This one, th- uh, I'm trying to remember all the categories. Uh, this one's. This one is. Uh, help me out. What's what's some of the other categories of triage? Expect. That's the last one. We're not going to do that one. Thank you though. <laughs> Urgent. Urgent is one. Dale skipped ahead. Dale's preaching. He doesn't know it. Urgent is one of the cat. Ur- Urgent is a category where where they need to get help right away or they're not going to make it. Right. So we categorize the people that are wounded right away, and we rush to them. Act, act like we're, we're all medical personnel. We're running to help, right? Because really, that's, that's what we are. But there's one category, thanks, Dale. There's one category that, that really doesn't apply to triage in this, in this instance, and it is expectant. Expectant is a category where people are not going to make it. Their wounds are so severe, it's only a matter of time. And there isn't anything medically that a doctor would really be able to do except make them comfortable, and they're going to succumb to their wounds eventually. But you know what? Do you know what's funny about that category in the church? We don't believe that for a second, Amen. right? Amen. We don't believe that for a second because we don't believe that there's anybody too far gone spiritually. Amen. There's no one who's too far gone, too steeped in sin, too... too too full of themselves, too prideful, too antith- antithetical to Christ that, that can't be reached because we are a people of Christ. We're a people of hope. We know that one word from the, from the gospel, one word from Jesus can change everything. And the person that looked like they were expectant, looked like they were going to succumb to their wounds, the stuff that they've, they've 
experienced in their life, the places that they were going, doing the things that were hurting them, it can change just like that. Because that's what Jesus does. He makes, makes the old new. Calls it a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And it happens just like that. But I'll tell you when it doesn't happen as often. It doesn't happen as often when, it, when us, his people, don't run and try to help. Because we weren't meant to carry these burdens alone. And when somebody is struggling, we got to be the kind of people to go and help. So we bear with each other. Do you know what surprises me? Do you know what surprises me about this whole hospital analogy? And, and, and you, know, you know what surprises me is that, is that we're surprised that there's sick people in a hospital. Sick people in church. People that, there's sin right here, right here in the church. Why is that so surprising? If you think about it, we are a hospital for people who are struggling with sin. Why shouldn't we expect to see a mess here and sinful people here? Why, why is that such a shock to us all? But it should be. This is not a place for all the pristine and you don't see any gold-laden stuff in here, right? That's, this, this is not a place for that. This is a place for people to get well. And this is a place where these people, us people, the grace people at Grace right here will come alongside and help in the middle of sin. In essence, we're all hospital workers. We get a chance to come alongside people and help them with their wounds. We dress them. We care for them. We run to them. We take part in the restoration and healing of people. That, that right there is what we're called to do. I can prove it to you. You want me to prove it? Want to? Yep, I'll prove it to you. If you look, look, look at Luke chapter 5, 27 through 31. We'll let Jesus prove it to you. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, doing what Pharisees and teachers of the law do, sandpaper people, belonged to their... Uh, who belonged to their sect, complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's good enough for me. If Jesus said, said that we are here, not for the healthy, but for the sick, then, then we ought to be the kind of place that welcomes the sick into our building and into our lives. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't not do it. Don't run the other way. I know, like I said, I know it's going to be messy, but, but we're called to that. And, and you know what? We're going to have, we have spiritual help. We have spiritual help and gifts that if we bring them to full bear into people's lives, things are going to change. Things are going to change for good. So let's talk quickly before we go to that. Let's talk a little bit about carrying and what carrying somebody's burdens really means. We're called to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, we'll fulfill the law of Christ. Now, in this chapter, uh, chapter 6 of Galatians, there's really two kinds of carrying going on here. The first one is, is in verse 5. That is more of a carrying and gives a connotation of carrying one person's load. Like you were designed to carry this load. So if you have like a, a, a backpack or something, if you take everything that, that you can and stuff it in that backpack, there's no way for you to get it heavy enough that one person couldn't carry it. It's got two straps. It cinches up right here. It's designed for one person to carry. That is the kind of carrying in verse 5. Carry, carry your burdens. You need to carry your, carry your load. Now, the cool thing about that carry is, is when you get used to carrying that one load, it's like when I was in the Army, and you, you get this rucksack on, and you put a lot of stuff in there that you may or may not need, but it's on the packing list, so you have to put it in there, and logic, it defies logic what you need to put in there. But anyways, you put it in there anyways because somebody told you to, and you're like, oh, you know, yes, Sergeant, okay. So you put it in there. You know what the cool thing about that is? If you wear it for long enough, after a while, you don't even notice, you don't even know it's there. 
if you've walked around for half a day with 60 pounds on, after a while, you get used to it. And you're not even, it's like it's not even there. And, and that, is, that is pretty cool because at that point, that's become part of you. You're used to carrying that load. You are now able to not just carry your own load, but help somebody else carry theirs, which is the point of the second carry in verse 2. In verse, uh, verse 2, it's carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. The second kind of carrying gives the connotation of something that was really meant for more than one person, like a group lift. If you've, if you've ever done log PT in the Army, then you've got this big old log. It's literally a log. Six, eight people on this log, and you toss it around and have a lot of fun with it, right? Do you want to know the hardest thing about log PT is when one person can't carry their load and suddenly they drop off of the log. You want to talk about heavy? See, it, that analogy really shows you how important it is for everybody to do their part and help each other carry their load. Well, the second carry is, is just like that. Uh, it's like everything in this second uh, category of carry has this big sticker on it, two-man lift. It takes more than one person. If you try to pick it up, it's got two handles on it for a reason, too. It's got more than, it's got, got more than one place to lift it and carry it, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't look at a two-man lift and say, oh, I got this. Well, you might. You wouldn't do that in your 30s, but you might in your 20s. You might pick it up and do that. But you won't do it in your 30s because you've already learned by then not to do that, right? But it is designed for more than one person to carry, and I can prove by a couple examples that, that, that this is how things really should be. If you tell me something in your life right now that God has helped you overcome, something that you've really struggled with, something that took a while, something that you had to really pray about, something you had to read and dig deep, something you had to sit and be quiet and say, Lord, wh- why I don't want to do this anymore. I'm struggling with this. Think of whatever that is. Think of whatever it is. Now think of the person that helped you. I guarantee you were not alone. You were not alone in that. If you were in the church, you weren't alone. Somebody stood beside you and helped you carry the load. Whether they knew you had the load or not, God sent somebody to you to help you carry this load. Because he knows we need each other. And if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're going to go where he tells you to go. You're going to walk next to somebody for reasons unbeknownst to you. And you'll show up just at the right time to help somebody pick up the other end of that. Here's another example. Say you've got something that's really heavy. And you see somebody dragging it. It's got two handles on it, just like everything else. It's got two handles on it, and they're dragging it through the foyer, making marks on the nice wood floor out there. What, what's your reaction going to be? You, if you see him, well, not just making a mark on the floor, but if you see somebody dragging something and you're able... You're going to go over there and pick up the other side and help them, right? I mean, isn't that what running to somebody means? Right? We don't run away from stuff like that. You wouldn't even think of letting them drag that thing through the foyer. You wouldn't think of that. Well, why, why is, is let, letting somebody carry something that's so heavy that it's, it's practically crushing them? Why would that be okay? It's not. It's not. Same guy in the foyer dragging the same thing. He's dragging along. You react. Like, I'm going to go help that guy. I run over there. I I go to pick up the other side of the handle. He's like, no, I got it. Nope, don't need help. Not ready, not ready to hear it. You can see the mark that's that's been left all the way through the foyer. Glenn's rolling over right now. All that, pi- all that tile is going to have to be replaced, brother. Sorry. You can see the marks he's left. They're everywhere. You can see, you could follow the trail of where he's been dragging this thing to the bottom, but he's not ready for help. This is where the spiritual side of this really comes in. You who are spiritual, you who are spiritual are the ones who get to restore. Because if you don't think you're going to have to use all the spiritual gifts you've been given and be full of the Holy Spirit to help somebody in that case, you're wrong. 
you're going to need at least three helpings of patience to walk beside them because you're going to have to start praying right now because they, have no, they are not interested in having help, even though they've left marks from the parking lot all through this building, into the bathroom, out around through the office. They, they're, not, they're not ready. And you're going to have to be patient. And you're going to have to be kind. And you're going to have to suffer with them. And you're going to have to love them through this. You're going to have to be compassionate. You're going to have to be dogmatic about praying for them every day and not letting them go. Even though they just told you no to their face, you know that the need is there, so you won't leave them alone. The only way to do that is to be full of the Holy Spirit. God will tell you, if you listen, when it's time to go back and help them pick up that burden. The Holy Spirit and the gifts are the key to all of this. You want to help, e- you want to be a good brother and sister? Got to listen to the Holy Spirit. You want to be work in the, in, the, in the world of restoration? You want to help somebody? You want to be the one that runs to the problem instead of running away from it? You want to be working in this hospital? Got to be full of the Holy Spirit. Got to bring your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You got to, those are all in this chapter too, or just right before it in chapter five. It's on the same page (coughs) in my Bible. You got to bring all that to bear into the situations in order to help somebody because the first one of those spiritual gifts, what is it? Love. If you want to fulfill the law of Christ, which is the, the last part of this, what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ starts with love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second, the second most important thing is to love your neighbor like yourself. And if you love your neighbor like your brother and sister, when they're having trouble, you'll run to them too. When they don't want to hear it, you'll pray for them. You'll bring all the spiritual fruit to bear into that relationship until they know that you are there to help them, until they say, okay, I know I can't carry this anymore. I need help. Maybe it's just looking back long enough to see the marks on the floor and realize that they've been dragging this longer than they can remember. Their arms are tired and they need us. And we need each other when that happens because we're hard-headed too. We don't always want to admit that we're having problems, but this should be the kind of place where we admit when we're struggling with something. So we shouldn't have to fear about somebody complaining or gossiping about us or somebody fighting the wrong battle and going off on a tangent, missing the whole boat when you needed help and they were standing right next to you and you missed it because you were mad about what was on CNN that day. This has got, we've got to be a place that's full of spirit and listening so that we can help each other carry the burdens of this life. Because the goal, the goal, the goal is to be Christ-like. That's what we're here for. We want to represent Jesus in this world. So when somebody walks into our life or walks into this place, they can feel the love right away. They can feel the acceptance. They don't, nobody's looking down on them at what they're wearing or where they're coming from, but they feel and they know that the people in this place, in the church, are going to love them. And if you don't think that's the most attractive, beautiful thing that will help somebody find Jesus faster than anything, You're wrong. It is. It's beautiful. Because you know that the Lord is working on everybody. He's drawing people to him. That's what he does. And we who are spiritual, we get to go meet everybody in the middle of their mess and tell them about Jesus. Love is the key to fulfilling the law of Christ. And when we love the Lord with all our hearts, all our minds and our souls, we love our neighbors like ourselves. We treat people in the church like their brothers and sisters and we help those outside the church see how clearly and how much Jesus loves for them because he's died for them too. Let me tell you, at the end of the Sandpaper People sermon, the the whole series, let's sum it up right here. Spirit-led people. People who are led by the Spirit are too busy loving others to be Sandpaper People. We don't have time for that. It's not part of who we are. We'll, we're, we're spiritual people. We're led by God. We love people. We take all our spiritual gifts into full bear and we bring them with us wherever we go. We lift up 
we encourage, we love, we come alongside, we help with restoration, we carry each other's burdens, and when we get done, people are closer to Jesus than they ever have been before. Here's what I know. In this place, we are brothers and sisters, and we ought to act like it. In this place, we are like a hospital. It should not surprise us to have wounded people in here. We work in the same hospital, and we should be the people with the gloves and the little name badges and running to people to help them when they're hurting, help each other when we're hurting. That gets us involved in the healing and restoration of people. We carry each other's burdens. We can only do that when we're in the Spirit. That's, that's how we do it. And when we love like this, when we love each other like Christ loves us, we fulfill the law of Christ. And that is awesome and attractive and draws people closer to Jesus. That's the kind of, that's the kind of church I want to go to. If that's the kind of be- people you want to be, then, hey, we're all in the right place, right? That's awesome. That's, that's amazing because that's what I want to see happen. If you want the world to be different, we've got to start right here, take care of each other, get each other built up, walk into being spiritual people, and then take those gifts we've been given out into the world so th- they can know Jesus. So we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to respond. Uh, Ashley's going to come up and... Hunter's going to come up, and, and we're going we're gonna to have a song. So I don't know how God's calling you to respond today. There's lots of different ways. Maybe you need to confess. Maybe you need to grab somebody. Maybe you were afraid before. You didn't understand that this was a place, that this is a safe place. This is a place of healing and restoration. And you've got something on your heart that you've been struggling with forever. Maybe right now would be a great time for you to grab somebody that you trust and say, I'm struggling with this. I can't carry it by myself anymore. Look at the marks behind me. I need help. Help me do that. Maybe you know somebody that's not there yet and you've been praying for them and you're using up all your patience on them. (laughs) Maybe you need to come and pray for them this morning. Maybe you need to be dogmatic this morning and come and just lift them up and and pray that the Lord will continue to draw uh, them to himself. Maybe you've never heard anything about Jesus and you walked in here today not knowing what to expect here here's here's what it is Jesus loves you we have all we're all we have all sinned everybody has fallen short of the glory that God intended for us but I have good news Jesus died so that we could be free if you believe in him that he rose from the dead if you confess that he is Lord with your heart then you will be saved just like everybody else and you can call on his name. That salvation will be secure. And you keep calling on his name every single day. And see if he won't come beside of you. Come inside of you. Make you a new creation. Set you on a new path. And rock your world and change your life forever. You will be a different person that you ever thought possible. Ask the people 20 years of my past. Call any of my buddies in high school. You. It's all true. Everything you heard about Jesus being Lord, loving you, dying for you, it's all true. It's real. And you can have it today. So let's pray. Jesus, we